The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Our next speaker uh, is Jens Kaufmann, uh, who is a postdoctoral scholar here at Caltech. Uh, his research expertise is in molecular clouds and formation, early stages of star formation. And uh, he's used facilities uh, ranging from radio millimeter, uh, submillimeter on the ground uh, to far infrared uh, and uh, mid infrared from space. And he is going to compare for us uh, the um, uh, comparison of airships to uh, different platform, uh, various other platforms, and uh, talk about the advantages. So, Jens. So, more or less, exactly a year ago, uh, I organized a workshop at JPL on exactly the same topic, but with a much smaller focus. So it's really great to see that this has uh, now grown into this much larger um, uh, workshop. So I'm charged with comparing airships with other science platforms. Um, this essentially boils down to the question, why do you want to use airships? And I should make clear here, uh, I'm specifically talking here uh, about the astronomical perspective. I largely skip Earth science essentially because I don't know too much about it. And I think I'm also focusing particularly here on some larger airships um, much of that, what I'm saying, is also applying to smaller platforms, which are cheap and maybe more flexible, et cetera, et cetera. But much of it uh, here focuses on the larger vehicles. So if you think about astronomical observatories, there are essentially two factors or two groups of factors you have to take into account. On one hand, there are the astronomical constraints. Because what you essentially need to do is you want to detect and resolve celestial objects at some quality. But then, of course, there are also practical constraints in the sense that you have to build and maintain the telescope or the observatory which you are running at a budget. So um, uh, you don't have infinite money, etc. Essentially, what you will have to do is to balance these factors. And how you balance them de determines um, the science you will be able to do with your observatory. So let's have a quick look at astronomical constraints. Obviously, you want to be able to resolve fine detail in celestial sources. You want to be able to zoom in. And um, as you can already see in this image here, uh, so two images taken essentially with two-meter telescopes, one on the ground, one is the Hubble in space, and you can already see that just by going into space where you have lesser atmosphere above you, you're going to have a much higher quality of the images. It's just shown here um, to a bit more quantitatively. This is an isoplanetic angle. This is the size um, uh, above which you can correct an image perfectly. And as you see, that increases uh, with altitude um, just because you have less and less turbulence above you. Um, this is the coherence length. This essentially um, gives you the largest size, the largest meaningful size of a mirror you can place to resolve objects. And again, this increases significantly with altitude. Is, it, is that part based on the error, or is that all calculation? This is, to a large extent, modeling. And it's to my understanding that uh, much of this is actually not well calibrated. And I think I've taken that from one of your papers. Uh, <laughs> This is, this, um, so there, it's my understanding that we still have to, that, that there's a need to, to research this and to, to quantify this better than what it's um, uh, available at the moment. So the other factor is the high sensitivity. You want to be able to detect faint objects. And again, obviously, uh, same size of telescope, one on the ground, one on space, and you can see much more faint stars. Uh, essentially, again, because you have lesser atmosphere above you, lesser absorption. But it's not only that you will be able to detect fine, um, uh, more faint objects, but you will also be able to detect uh, different sorts of objects, so to say. 
because from the ground, obviously, you cannot observe at visible, visible wavelength. While if you're in space, like here with the, with the Spitzer Space Telescope, you can observe infrared light, which is just not visible from the ground. And suddenly you see different categories of objects, uh, very young stars which are deeply embedded in dust clouds, and you just cannot see these objects from ground. And of course, infrared light is just one component of a large spectrum. Um, and as you see here, very globally, um, depending on the wavelength range at which you are observing, uh, you can see different sorts of stars, so to say, different components of the interstellar gas. If you want to understand all of the, or if you ha want to have a global understanding of the physics of space, of what's happening in space, you will have to be able to observe as many of these phenomena as possible. And uh, obviously, if you go higher in the atmosphere, you open many of these windows that's shown here. I think Stephen Lord is going to talk about this in the next talk in a bit more detail. Essentially, what's shown here is the transmission as a function of wavelength. And if you climb up high in the atmosphere, um, many of these spectral ranges, like this here, which is not observable from the ground, gets filled in. Um, this, for example, is a very critical wavelength because this is essentially where most of the light of uh, star-forming clouds comes out. And so if you want to understand star formation either nearby or in the distant universe, you will have to be able to access this part of the spectrum. This is essentially because when you climb up, you leave a lot of water vapor below you. And so the water vapor contributes to the absorption. And by climbing high in the atmosphere, well, you have a better transparency. But then there are also practical constraints. Um, and obviously, Astronomical equipment is usually very complex and often very large. So you will have to be able to house complex and large instruments. You also have to build and maintain a telescope at the location where you are going to, to run it. And uh, that can be very complicated in space where uh, you have essentially to send up the shuttle to repair the Hubble. But if you're on top of Mauna Kea, then you just have to send up somebody by car and fix a problem or run the telescope directly um, uh, uh, hands-on. Costs are another limiting factor. If you're thinking about space missions, uh, it costs a couple of hundred million dollars usually. And the large observatories are in the billion-dollar regime. But if you're running a small balloon bowl, not even necessarily small, a balloon-borne telescope, then a couple of million dollars are sufficient to do that, and sometimes even less. Control of the telescope is another important factor. This is a look into SOFIA, an airborne observatory, about which I'm going to talk a bit more in a minute. And you can see here uh, the astronomers can tr control the observations as they are happening, and in principle, the engineers even have direct access to the instrument in case there is a small problem. They can fix it during the flight. But on the other hand, um, you have balloons. Um, many of the balloon flights today are done in Antarctica. And there's the big problem. Once the balloon drifts beyond the horizon, it's very difficult to communicate and ne not necessarily com possible to communicate at all. And so... Once the balloon is behind the horizon, um, the observations have to be executed automatically. So uh, you're not having very good control. There's one other very, very important reason why you need to have excellent direct access to the hardware. And that's, on one hand, the next generation of astronomers and engineers. It's necessary to have literal hands-on experience with equipment in order to develop uh, the, the next generation of, of scientists. But it's also important uh, to develop new instruments. Obviously, if you have a new instrument, it's not well developed at, um, in the first stages, so you will need to be able to, to fix problems as they're happening. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to access the instrumentation. Now let's have a look at what's out there in terms of observatories at the moment. Very broad brush. There is, on one hand, the 
category of ground-based observatories. Modern observatories nowadays are usually at high and dry places, uh, desert-like environments. Also, the South Pole fits that description because there's actually not much water in the air. So what are the advantages? Uh, it's very easy access. You drive up a mountain. Sometimes you have to take a plane, but you can easily get there. You can have very large structures, and it's very cheap. But, of course, the problem is you have only access to a limited part of the spectral range. Uh, you cannot observe all the wavelengths relevant for science. And you have limited sensitivity, again, because you have absorbing atmosphere above you. The, at the opposite end of the spectrum, you have the space-based observatories. Obviously, you have perfect transmission because you have no atmosphere above you. It's very stable, also in terms of temperatures, etc. so the telescope won't deform, etc., won't be affected by wind. It's extremely efficient in the sense that once you're up there, you can observe 24 hours a day, typically. But it's very expensive. You cannot really access physically the equipment. And it's, not, it's rather inflexible in terms of technology, meaning if you have a new upgrade to an instrument, uh, to physical hardware, you cannot simply exchange the part in an existing observatory, but you will have to build a completely new observatory to check in this upgrade. Then there are platforms in between. In particular, there is now uh, an airborne observatory, fixed-wing observatory, SOFIA, which is essentially a 747 with a door through which a telescope can look out. This flies at of order 40,000 feet. It flies out of Palmdale, California, but in principle can fly also in other parts of the world. This telescope has a size of 2.5 meters. The idea is to fly this uh, three or four times per week once it's fully operational. There's one particular feature about SOFIA, and that's because the door is on one side of the aircraft and the telescope has to look out. It essentially means that you will have to observe at right angles from the flight direction. And that means that observing with that telescope is not necessarily, is, is uh, slightly inefficient in the sense that um, the observing direction is driven by the flight direction of the plane. And you, as you see here, for a typical flight plan, it's very complicated to uh, arrange an efficient flight plan. Also, because of all the rare airspace regulations in Southern California, because you have to avoid all these zones. So, SOFIA has the large advantage that um, transmission is okay, it's not perfect, but it's okay. Very easy access, as said, because you can just walk up to a running instrument and fix problems as they occur. And it's really, really great for instrument development, uh, because you, if you discover a problem, you can repair it over during the day, and you can fly upgraded hardware on the next night. But observing procedures are not very uh, efficient, and one big issue is it's very expensive. So the lifetime costs are of order of $4 billion estimated. Another option uh, are stratospheric balloons. Uh, they operate of, at of order 120,000 foot. They can carry payloads of up to 2,000 kilogram. And you can also recover them in ideal circumstances. Here, for example, if you fly above Antarctica and you drop uh, near your base and you drop it, drop the payload back on the ice, you can collect it. Flight durations are typically of order a couple, 10 days. Just to give you some example flight profiles, uh, you can fly, for example, from Sweden to Canada, which takes, in this particular example, four days. In principle, you could continue circling here but uh, Russian airspace is usually closed, though I've heard that there might be possibilities to open that up at some point. Uh, very often done at the moment are flights from Antarctica. The idea is that you keep circling above the ice so that you can 
collect your payload once you cut it loose and the payload comes down on a parachute. This example flight here took uh, 54 days, which is rather long. Um, more typical are flight durations of something like 15 to 30 days. Other hope is to uh, start flying above the southern oceans. Uh, here, for example, is a 15-day flight uh, from, Austra from Australia once around the globe and back. And so that would give you a couple of 10 days. And of course, uh, independent of these pro flight profiles shown here, in principle, you could just keep circling around here or here if you don't care about collecting your payload. Then you could uh, keep it up for a much longer duration than what's indicated here if you don't care about collecting it. Have these happened, the southern ocean flights? Again, please? Have these occurred, the southern ocean flights? This is an actual flight. And there have been, uh, there have been a couple of uh, science flights uh, from Australia over to, to southern America. That's another way where, how you can collect uh, your payload. So for the balloons, um, great thing is they have very, very good transmission because they are very, very high in the atmosphere. And they are very cheap. But there's limited control of the experiment. And uh, the efficiency is also not so great because you just, depending on the, on the sort of your experiment, with the big experiments, you get a flight per season, one flight per year. It depends. So um, some of the, it, it depends also a bit on how sturdy you build your equipment. There are um, there are telescopes. Uh, once you drop them on the parachute, it's not necessarily a, a soft landing. And um, there are payloads where most of the payload actually gets destroyed and cannot be reused. There are other experiments which, if you build it really sturdy, just attach it again to the next balloon and fly it again. But for the larger telescopes, it's, it's an issue. And so in Antarctica, for example, you also are limited to the, to the, to the summer. So you uh, cannot go there uh, any time of the year, but you have to be there when the conditions are right, that you can have people there and the, that the wind speeds are low enough. Yeah. Um, so I should mention, of course, if you are above uh, Antarctica, there is a problem of uh, seeing satellites. So you cannot see geostationary satellites where most of the satellites are. And the current technology is essentially to write everything out onto hard disks and to collect that. But that might depend on the experiment. There are other experiments who write it out on, date, on, on the drives. So essentially it means that if you go up in the atmosphere, you have better data quality, but of course it's much more difficult to observe at high altitude. So where do the airships fit in there? Um, there are some obvious factors about airships. And I should mention here, I'm talking now about the more heavy lifting ones which are going up at high altitudes. So such vehicles have sizes of 100 to 200 meters. Uh, obviously, there is um, lift from buoyancy. Um, they have motors, so you can con they are flying in a controlled fashion, and particularly you can keep them overhead. Costs are probably per vehicle of order $100 million or more, but that's something we have to discuss here in the workshop. There are essentially two designs possible for such vehicles, something which I would call extreme duration vehicles, um, meaning you launch them once and then they go up to a very high altitude and stay there for a very, very long time uh, with solar power or so. 
uh, meaning months or years. Uh, disadvantage is that recovery is not necessarily straightforward and not necessarily possible to reuse these vehicles, depending on how you design them. Um, the other option would be vehicles reg with regular flights, so they fly like aircraft, uh, but with much longer flight durations. There are just concepts uh, which are, so th there are some vehicles which have been designed to fly months and years to these altitudes and they are just uh, not designed to be reused. Um, of course you can build other vehicles, uh, but that's not necessarily what, uh, that's not always what is designed uh, in particular for the military. There are just military applications where you don't need to reuse the vehicle and so the vehicle, um, if you would lift development for the military, for our purposes, um, those vehicles would just not be able to, to land and be used again. So they but, have to bring it down at some point, right? Yes, but not necessarily in pristine condition. <laughs> there, there are vehicles which are just, um, they're essentially being landed by ripping open uh, the hull, and then you cannot use them again. So one thing to keep in mind is that astronomical equipment starts to produce large data rates, and this might be a lower limit for, for several experiments. So if you have an airship which you can just keep overhead, it would be really great because you have direct communication and you can uh, downlink data, and you can also control the observations as they are happening. That's not so straightforward with, with balloons um, once they are behind the horizon, uh, but... Yeah, there, there might be other, it's, it's, it's at least not as straightforward as communicating with an airship. If you have an airship which can land and be relaunched, um, one big advantage would be that you can switch payloads. So you bring down the airship, exchange the payload, you launch it again, and in case you realize that the blue payload is bro broken, uh, you just land and fix the problem. That would be really great, and that's something balloons wouldn't offer. Observation planning and observation efficiency is, um, has the potential of being very high. So um, in space, you could observe all year round, so that gives you eight or 9,000 hours. There are some ground-based observatories which claim to observe half of that. But then if you look to SOFIA or balloons, um, the observing efficiency goes down significantly. So if you have an airship which flies every second week, for example, uh, you would beat many of these other observatories. Just a second, Jim. So that you're, you're assuming you're observing 24 hours a day every other week, right? And so that doesn't work if you can't work in the afternoon, for example. That's true. So I, um, if, you, if you're observing, well, take your eye. You cannot observe um, stars with your naked eye now. And that's on one hand because there's a bit of absorption, but it's also because the sky is very bright. You cannot see stars in contrast against the bright background of the sky. You're, you're, you could do that at infrared or so, um, but there's... One other thing, thing one could keep in mind is, uh, of course, you can always go to the pole and fly in the polar night. If you have a vehicle which can generate electricity by itself, then you could have a very, very long um, duration observations in the polar night. I have to move on because I'm ru running out of time. Uh, so if you come to Earth science, of course, there is also high potential if you have a platform flying a couple of 10 kilometers high 
You can survey large areas, and you can do that also for long duration, so you can do time series by just flying over the same spot for a long period. So now what are the open questions uh, compared to other platforms? Uh, some, uh, something where I don't see clear at the moment is the atmospheric transmission, uh, meaning what obje objects exactly can you study at various altitudes? And that's something I personally would like to understand much better. Another factor which is unclear to me is what is the largest telescope size what you, that you could fly on an airship and what's the pointing accuracy? Both these factors together will determine the resolution which you can achieve and the sensitivity. Uh, costs are, of course, another factor which have to be a uh, major discussion here um, compared to other platforms. Uh, this is for, if you consider larger missions, this is just a reference table uh, uh, to which you might want to compare an airship. I personally think that um, if you think about very large vehicles, which cost uh, of order $100 million or more, I think it will be very crucial if we want to make that happen for astronomy, we have to get Earth science partners involved. If we only have an astronomical platform which is at that cost level, I think uh, that will be very, very challenging to sell that. So I think it would be a very good idea if we would find ways to, if we want to have large and costly vehicles, I guess we will have to um, join forces with Earth science in some way. Thank you.